Hello, my name is Nigel Griffiths. I work for IBM. This is part one of a series of videos looking at the Power9 and the servers they go in and getting the best performance. On the bottom left, you can see how to contact me. If I add up the Twitter, LinkedIn and YouTube followers, I have 10,000 and more. The expert blog, although I've had 4 million hits, um, is actually on the move. We'll have to track down where that goes when that actually happens. Now, I concentrate on AIX. I do quite a lot of Linux on power. I don't do any IBM I, I just don't have the skills. Quite a lot of this will apply to all three operating systems. Sometimes I'll dive a bit more into AIX. There is one slide actually near the end which is on IBM I and where to get the stats. Now here's the content for the series. Quite where I'll break the different videos, I don't know until I record them and see how long they are. I'd like to thank Steve Nisipani. He's my counterpart colleague at IBM USA. I've taken some of the content and ideas from him. Thanks, Steve. First of all, let's clear up something that really winds me up and annoys me and will boost your street cred. Which one of these is the right way of writing it down? Now, you are a above average technical person because you're watching my videos right and i hope i really do hope that you're shouting six at the screen and you are right this is the way we write this down i see a lot of managers and uh, consultants like people some people writing articles on the internet getting it wrong and it really winds me up now why does that wind me up well, that's because power stands for something is performance optimized with enhanced risk. Now, of course, risk is an abbreviation. So what does that mean? In IBM terms, we call it reduced instruction set cycles. Some people say computers at the end there. But IBM wanted to highlight the fact that by having a reduced instruction set, less operations that the computer, the CPU can actually execute actually means a couple of things. One is when you come to make a new chip, you don't have so many instructions you've got to program in the microcode running inside it. And also the point of it is that having less of them, we can concentrate more development effort on them and making them run fast, hopefully in a single clock cycle, and that boosts the performance. Just cutting down the number of instructions doesn't actually help you any. I think some of the problems we have is because the part of IBM that makes the power chips and the power 9 processors is called power systems, spelt with a lower case. First of all, we're going to look at some good housekeeping things that you should be doing anyway as part of running a professional computer room. I'm sure you've already got a copy of this Power9 Performance Best Practice document. There's a great big URL. I'll put that into the uh, YouTube page for this video. And lots of detail on there, and we got some links on the second page into developer work, so we're going to have to fix those up in the next few months. But a lot of details in here. You can see it's heavy on the AX side, uh, but some of the features in here, like the VIO server, well, that applies to all the operating systems. So let's sort of summarize that. I've put them up in here and it's probably difficult to read, so I'll get rid of the background. Here we go. Now the ones in darker red, uh, we're going to go into those quite specifically in some of the uh, videos in this series. The other ones that are in uh, pink, I guess you'd call that, um, large queues, well that's for, you know, having uh, queues on your disks, that's regular sort of stuff. Uh, Java, there's a Java Development Kit 8 out in there, that's got performance enhancements. If you're doing a lot of live partition mobility, then in Power 9, then we have a DPO, that will stop the uh, LPARs if they, when you actually move them, they have to work on the spare resources, if you like, on the machine, so sometimes they're not aligned nicely for the CPUs being near the memory, but DPO can fix that, it's now available on Power 9. We have new compilers, that often gives you a performance boost if you're actually compiling your own code. Uh, there's the throughput mode that allows us to change the way when new processes start up, how they're spread across the CPUs. Now, everybody knows that the size of an LPAR or virtual machine when you're running on PowerVM is divided not by the entitlement. The size of the logical partition is decided by the virtual processor number. And so by default, the first thread goes on the first virtual processor and then the second to the second virtual processor and spreads out across all the virtual processors and then when you start yet more applications it starts using the second third fourth fifth and up to eight threads on those 
virtual processors. The throughput mode does it a different way. So it will put the first program you start up on the first VP and the second will be on the first VP and the third will be on the first VP and it will fill up that first virtual processor before it starts using other virtual processors. That can help out with some particular types of workload. Next one down there is get your VAO server right. Don't starve them. If the VAO server is low on CPU and low on memory then everybody hurts so watch them and make sure they get enough space particularly the memory if you've got high speed adapters anything above uh, 8 gigabits a second is regarded as a high speed adapter they need buffering otherwise you can't run at full speed and then there's um, tuning on your virtual ethernet a well known area again if you go to the technical universities in Europe and America you can meet um, Alexander Paul absolutely brilliant guy on the network and get his presentation in orange there I got in um, don't use the AX restricted tunables only use those if you've got a performance problem you've raised it with support and they tell you to switch them on otherwise you switch those on at your own risk and you can actually slow down your computer by making random changes in tunables that we don't think most users should be fiddling with the red ones here will come up in uh, later charts very different topic we're looking at memory dim prices. A technical view, a simple view, is that there's a rule of thumb that as you double the size of memory, it costs about double. Sounds fair, doesn't it? In practice, that's not what happens. Now, the practical reality of the chip manufacturers for memory is that they don't want to have dozens of different sized DIMMs. They're probably producing them on different lines. And maybe they've got four lines, four different sizes they can actually produce at any one time. So say this manufacturer now has now moved into 128 gigabyte DIMMs. They're no longer making the 8 gigabyte DIMMs, but they've got plenty of stock. They can make them pretty quick and be doing that for a number of years. But once the stocks get low, then they're in short supply and it's all supply and demand. So they start cranking up the prices of the 8 gigabyte DIMMs because they've only got a few thousand in stock. At the moment, I find that some of the 8 gigabyte DIMMs are more expensive than the 16 gigabyte. So it'd be absolutely insane to buy the 8 gigabyte DIMMs. Now, there's two ways to go. You could buy, say you're going to buy um, 16 8 gigabyte DIMMs. Now, you could buy 16 16 gigabyte DIMMs, have twice as much memory at the same money. Now, there's a little bit of pressure on you probably to try and save money. But if you reduce the number of DIMMs in your computer, you can reduce the actual performance of your computer. You like all those different channels coming out of the power line chips and give you maximum memory bandwidth. So be careful just trimming down the number of DIMMs. There's not many workloads that can't benefit from a good bank of extra memory supplied to them, perhaps in database uh, caches and things like that. Some of the modern workloads actually live and breathe on more memory. And if your LPARs don't need more memory, well, you could probably slip on you know, another 20 LPARs onto your machine if you got the memory, but you can't if you don't. At the other end of the DIM range, the latest ones that come out, say for example it's now 128 gigabytes, of course they've got double the number of transistors, so they have to shrink down all the transistors, they're very hard to make, the yields in the production line are much lower in making these uh, work properly, and because of that, and because there's high demand for big RAM, they instead of being twice the price of a 64 gig, they're now like four times the price of a 64 gig. And I've seen people just casually configure things up with like four 128 gigabyte uh, DIMMs and they, the memory can actually cost a similar price to the entire rest of the computer if you do that. Of course, if you're going for that maximum memory possible in a particular server, then you'll have to be paying these high prices. So that's the only way to do it. So a few little rules in there. Watch the low end and watch the top end. Don't get caught out by these uh, simple rules. This is a rolling feast. In a couple of years' time, this will all move one step to the right, and the biggest DIMMs will be a higher number, and the 16 gigabytes will be going rapidly up in price until you really shouldn't be buying them anymore. All of the Power9 servers have been out for a year now, at the end of 2019. Some of them have been out 18 months. What I want to encourage you to do is look at your HMC versions and your system firmware versions and make sure you've updated those fairly recently. This will remove uh, bugs in your systems. You don't want to hit a bug that IBM hit a year ago. Increase your reliability 
and actually increase your performance as well. There are some critical fixes. These are not optional. When we say critical, these are, for example, something that we can detect corruption in memory. At that point, we must not let you write that piece of memory back into your database, otherwise you end up with a corrupted database. And the only safe thing for it to do is actually to halt the LPAR or indeed the entire machine to stop that problem getting worse. And these are the sorts of fixes that go critical in IBM's opinion, and you really need those because you don't want to be going down there. The same goes for your operating system. Check that they are current and actually supported, that you've got all the service packs added, and that your LPARs are power nine aware. Now, if you're in a regulated industry, being a couple of years behind on your security fixes is not a good place to go. And if you're running your LPARs in power eight mode, then you're getting 95% or so of the power nine performance. That's okay. But for example, if you're running AIX6, it only knows about power 7. It's not even power 8 aware, and you're not going to benefit from a lot of the performance. A few comments on AX. I'm not going to give you the latest supported list because in a month or two that will be out of date. Of course, with AIX, it's the OS level minus S command. The S gives you those four digits at the end, which is the year number and the week number, so you can work out when it came out. And if it's more than two years old, you're probably very nearly out of date. If you're running AIX 6.1, then you really should get up to technology 9, service pack 11. 12 may come out eventually. Um, this is the latest version, and it'll have all the fixes that are possibly available to you, but again, it's not supported. If you're running AIX 7, then you should put these sorts of numbers in here. Uh, these are the latest at the time I actually created this slide. I've been testing the latest release at this time, 7.2.tl4, before it's actually become generally available. And I thought I'd discover a bug. It had 0, 0, 0, 0 at the end of the output. So I reported this back and the guy said, no, that's not a bug. It means you have not installed the mandatory service pack 1. What happens typically is we have the gold master of the install image, the DVD image, and that comes out maybe 10 to 12 weeks before the actual general availability date. But the test teams carry on running and they find lots of little problems and that goes into the first service pack and we want to force you to do that update to the first service pack on day one of trying your new TL. And that's how they're trying to show that to you. Now, what's a good way of finding out all your current versions? Well, it's right there on the HMC for our Power VM machines, including the year and the week number. The ones with them missing, uh, typically they're not actually powered up, so it says, well, I'm not quite sure what that is. Uh, sometimes if it's running Linux on power and I've forgotten to install the RMC packages, then it doesn't know. And then even if it, you do that, sometimes it just says it's Red Hat Linux Enterprise, but not the version. I'm pretty sure that the IPMI guys get this right too with a proper version number. Can you see there the one that's really, really embarrassing? It sticks out. Here we go. 2012. Whoa, seven years out of date. That's our repository where we just throw our ISO images on that machine. But uh, we really need to get that sorted out. It's actually embarrassing, isn't it? So which versions do you need to be at so that it understands that it's a Power 9 chip and can benefit from it? Well, here are the versions for AX7271. doesn't understand Power 9, but Power 8 will give you lots of the performance in Power 9. Of course, AX61 doesn't get the idea of it at all. And here's the other operating systems. Notice the, the Red Hat there needs to be at 7.5, but a particular different installation image called Alt. Well, that's it for this part one. We've looked at the first four items. We're next going to go into some more technical details about the Power 9 chip itself. In particular, the efficiency with the virtual processor to entitlement ratio. How fast is a Power 9 chip? And that's very fast. And how do they actually do that in uh, IBM Development Labs? How do they get it to go that fast? We'll do a slight detour at the end to look at what you need to know about Spectre Meltdown. If you enjoyed this part one of Power 9 getting the best performance, then please give us a thumbs up. Don't forget to subscribe.